Chaucer defined it as a story of him that stood in great prosperity and is fallen from high degree into misery and endeth wretchedly. For Aristotle, tragedy embodied the notion of catharsis. Can you outline for us what uh, Aristotle said in his poetics about tragedy and why it was so definingly important in Western culture for so long? Scholars have long quarreled and sometimes very loudly about just what that rather mysterious ancient Greek word means. Roughly, it seems to say there is a paradox. You go, you pay your seat in the theater, you volunteer to be harrowed. Something like, why do you volunteer to be harrowed? And secondly, I think even more difficult, why do you keep going back to be harrowed again? Often by the same tragic play. And he said, when it works, you leave with your emotions, certainly not scoured away, no, actively richer and perhaps a little more in balance. That in lives, which like for all of us, no personal tragedy, social tragedy, political tragedy, you're a little better equipped to take a balanced, a sane view. And, and, and that's something like that, perhaps, is meant by catharsis. It has been the most influential, as you say, single definition. Whether it's true is another question. I think uh, George does justice, of course, to Aristotle, but I, I'm interested in the point he makes about the voluntariness of our attendance at tragedy. We like it. People pay good money to go and see tragedies, and, and the question is why, and I'm not absolutely certain, I'm not, I'm not certain that George is certain, that sanity is the reason why we do that, that the fact that it does us good is the reason why we do that. I think I'd be inclined to say that it's something to do with the treatment, it's the way they tell them in tragedies that makes us go back for more. In other words, as Tolstoy says, if you reduce King Lear to its story, it's about a silly old man locked out on a windy night. But if you look at the way the story is told, the huge images in which Leah defines his pain. It's a very mysterious question, because we know the story, yet we're unutterably surprised every time it happens. And could I invoke the name of Freud, who really worried about this one a great deal, and then watched very young children playing, throwing away their most beloved toy, and pulling it back, throwing it away again. And he said, maybe tragedy is somewhat like that. We test our own ability to live with the grief and the emotion, not to master it in any cheap way, but to live with it and to draw from it a certain positive Perhaps strength is the wrong word, a kind of positive modesty or a kind of creative humility in front of human suffering and sadness. And we come back again and again because something is going on that is both very intimate and immensely public. We share with others the shock and the experience. And I just want to throw on the table one little thought experiment. Why is it that if one in a million times they cheated, there's a great moment in the play Oedipus, which was Aristotle's model, where the queen, knowing that there is unspeakable suffering ahead, says enough, stop it. Stop asking these questions, they will lead to absolute hell. Suppose a producer told that right. Oedipus is going to say, you're quite right. We're going to stop here and go to lunch. Now, why would we be so unutterably disappointed, almost to the point of nausea. In the dark, sometimes you miss the step at the end of a staircase, and you hit your foot on the rock, and it's not fright, it's kind of nausea that comes. Or if Hamlet said, look, let's avoid this, this sword play, somebody's going to get hurt, <laughs> I won't be, we'd be so bereft. Now that's a very curious fact. I think most people would share that feeling of excitement. Of, of living at a sort of a higher pitch as you come out of a really good play. Uh, my feeling would be that it, that it is something still to do with our, our existence in language. We 
we are linguistic animals, we are talking animals. And what you see in King Lear, or indeed in Oedipus, is language stretched to its limits to accommodate something which seems to be outside language, which seems to be beyond what you could talk about. Judeo-Christian vision of the world must contain within it hope, that is to say, either of resurrection, of redemption, of forgiveness, taking many forms. It is, and Dante insists on this, a commedia, a comedy not in any laugh sense, but it ends well. The tragedy ends badly and, and is a very special and peculiar form. Um, in about the 7th century BC, the Greeks, we don't know who, said the best thing is not to be born, after that to die very young, the worst is to live long. Oh, Leah will echo this. And this midnight view that we are somehow guests on an earth that is hostile, or enemies of the gods, or the objects of vengeance, and you can't really have, I think, a great Christian tragedy. And people have wrestled with this since, since the Renaissance. The Greeks saw damnation as in life, in the world. And that's a pretty bleak doctrine. Yes, you're quoting you, uh, that, that, that great book of yours, that you say the forces which shape or destroy our lives lie outside the governance of reason or justice. The Homeric warrior knows that he can neither comprehend nor master the workings of destiny. The burning of Troy is finally because it's brought about by the fierce sport of human hatreds and the wanton mysterious choice of destiny. And just one final question, which I think is a terrific sentence, is that Antigone and Oedipus strive to their fierce disasters in the grip of truths more intense than knowledge. So we're talking about a world without uh, redemption, without hope, uh, without purpose, uh, without... And we're talking of a world which one of the very few, if I may be wrong, but one of the very few towering tragic sensibilities, which is Samuel Beckett, sums up in a single unbearable sentence, he doesn't exist, comma, the best. A sentence which has the whole structure tragic. God doesn't exist. If he doesn't exist, it's a hideous bastard. If he does exist, he makes our lives hell. Beckett can do this, and the Greeks would have understood this sentence perfectly. But I'm not sure there can't be Christian tragedy. I would think, for example, of Faustus, who uh, makes the wrong choice. It seems to me that in that play, repentance is an available option for Faustus all the way through. He simply can't take it. He personally simply can't take it. But God is just. It's Faustus who can't choose the right option. And as I wanted to say from the beginning, is that tragedy consists not in the story. I wouldn't want to say that you can define it by a content, because the content, it seems to me, varies from one tragedy to another and from one epoch to another. It is a question, in my view, of the treatment of the story. It's the way you tell it that makes it tragic. So uh, what's grand about Faustus is particularly that final speech, see where Christ's blood streams in the firmament, or what's grand about Othello is his recognition of the appalling thing he's done. And again, he thinks of the last judgment. Desdemona, uh, like a pearl, lost to him forever. And that seems to me to be, it's that moment at which the language does justice to the pain that we feel the tragedy, not uh, a question of a, a content or an attitude to the world. I'm not trying to be clever, please believe me, I, I do not believe Shakespeare is a tragedian in any pure sense.
answers? No, it never is. But is it never? I mean, at the end of Lear, the fool is dead, and my poor fool dead. Uh, Lear, uh, Cordelia, uh, Goneril, Regan, uh, Albany, away we go, dead, 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 dead. And, and, and the whole play goes to... I'm fascinated by the distinction you, you make. Um, if that isn't the tragedy, then, then what are we talking about? No, it's a very complex mixed form like a great novel, like a great Dostoevsky or Tolstoy novel, where is the pulse of life will beat at the end, Fortin Brass will be a much better ruler than Hamlet would have been, Macbeth's successes will restore Scotland to fortune, Cassio will be an excellent governor of Cyprus, and that is brought home to us. Yes, Lear and Timon, which belong very closely together, may be as close as he gets to that unforgiving monotone, monotone in an almost technical sense of one note of horror which fills a Greek play. And life probably is very much as Shakespeare tells us it is, and it is very rarely as absolute tragedians say it is. We, there is no continuing timeless essence of something tragic, it seems to me. There's simply our use of the word, our use of the classification. But I would find my echoes of the, uh, what I think of as a continuing line of descent, whether we need to classify it as tragedy or not, from, uh, say, Marlowe and, and Shakespeare, I would find that descent, line of descent, picked up in cinema now, rather than on the stage, I think. I would think of something like The Third Man, for example, where now we have to move from a stage which is particularly primarily verbal to uh, a medium, a form which is primarily visual. And so I would see the, the grandeur in the imagery, the film imagery there. But I'm thinking that the, the third man is not really about the individual characters in the film. It's about the ruins of civilization after the war. It's set, you remember, in Vienna. And what we see endlessly is the rubble of one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. And, and the story ends in the sewers, in Vienna's own underworld. Uh, it, it, it's set in the international section, and what I think you have a sense of there is a whole civilization having collapsed, being itself in ruins. And that seems to me to pick up on the sort of end of King Lear as you were describing it, where again you have a whole civilization having collapsed. And if Edgar survives, it's only to say, we that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. But the movies can bring that almost unbearably intense and close. But knowledge possibly comes from intense concentration and a certain simplification. Tragedy does simplify in a very cruel sense. It helps us come back to certain fixities. Um, the desolation of the desert of a child, the useless. But the forms are melding. We're entering a period of such hybrid forms. We, we don't have time, we'd have to talk about modern opera, which has much of the greatest. One cannot speak about modern tragedy without Britain's Peter Grimes. I would argue it's absolutely crucial to an argument. Um, the end of Peter Grimes, the sense of loss, the death of the child, no doubt at sea, belongs to any discussion great tragedy. And the music tells us things uh, which, in your case, quite rightly, the language has in, in more traditional forms. And it, I think, helps us enormously be serious, it's a silly phrase, but be serious about ourselves. But remember, the underlying truth is very hard to take. Near the end of his life, a young friend asks Kafka angrily, Kafka stories, is there then no hope? The answers, there is abundance of hope, but none 